Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's mentoring hour. Uh, we will begin with a word of prayer. I'd like to request uh, any one of us to please lead in a word of prayer. Divya, would you be able to lead us, please? Sure, Pastor Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this uh, wonderful time that you've given us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity, Lord, to uh, ask questions, Lord, to uh, get, uh, Lord, your wisdom, Father, into uh, all the questions that we are having, Father. Thank you, Father, for the pastors. Thank you, Lord, for all those who are joining. Uh, Father, Lord, uh, bless each one of us, Father. Let your presence be with us uh, throughout this time. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Divya. Uh, so as we're all aware, the mentoring hour is a great time for us to ask questions. These questions can be pertaining to the things that we are learning in the course, or they can be questions outside of the course. Um, uh, it can be questions from daily life. So uh, if there are any questions, then please do post it on the chat, or you could please unmute your mics and uh, go ahead and ask these questions. All right. So even as we wait for uh, um, you know people to to share their questions here, uh, I just thought I would ask what uh, different ones of us are learning in our journey with the Lord. So if there's something new that you're learning, it'll be great if you can share it uh, with all of us. So this time is open. Anyone who would like to share what you're learning from God's word. Okay, once again, I think I will ask uh, Divya. Divya, uh, is there anything new that you're learning in this season? Um, actually, uh, I was just, uh, uh, like, uh, in, in my reading of the Bible, I was, uh, uh, getting more, um, into each verse, uh, like trying to understand the meaning, uh, of the words, uh, in a deeper way. Uh, so I think it's not like a peripheral kind of reading that I'm doing, uh, so, the Bible College has helped me uh, to have uh, interest in that in that way, uh, like to really understand. And uh, currently, I'm reading. Um, yeah, one thing that uh, uh, really struck me was in Hosea. Uh, I was reading Hosea, and one thing was like, uh, uh, without the lack of knowledge, uh, the people perish. That particular verse so um, that strike me a lot because uh, if I uh, stop uh, learning uh, and understanding more of God um, and trying to have a deeper relationship then I feel like uh, our growth will be stunted um, because we do not uh, uh, that relationship with God is so important and I really loved uh, in, uh, in the course uh, Developing the Human Spirit, uh, Pastor Ashish had told us about seven disciplines that we can uh, use for our growth, uh, like communion and reading the word, praying. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's helping me in my personal spiritual growth. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really wonderful, Divya, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. 
and exciting to know that your course your study here at apc bible college is also helping you uh, in your uh, journey with the lord so yeah thanks once again um uh, at this moment uh, i want, want to ask uh, all of us once again if you have any questions um if you have then you know, please do go ahead and post it on the chat or maybe ask by unmuting your mics All right. Uh, yes. So uh, actually, I have a question. I don't know if it's a very, uh, you know, um, it's a question that has an answer already. But I thought I would just uh, pose it for us here. You know, there are uh, in the current scenario, so many things are happening in the world. Uh, so I was just. Uh, asking myself this question you know how do you understand uh, the things that are unfolding you know, currently we have uh, a situation that is happening uh, between two particular countries so i just thought i would uh, you know uh, place it uh, and maybe you know if one of our faculty could uh, share your insights on this how do we understand the events that are taking place currently yeah thank you Okay. Um, yes, Pastor. I'll just share some thoughts and others, yes, please. others can also share. So, Thank you. Yeah, so we're seeing Russia invade Ukraine and uh, we're seeing just one other European country, Belarus, who's kind of, you know, just aligning themselves with Russia. And then, of course, we're also seeing some other countries that are non-committal like China, India, uh, who are not, you know, they're just taking, trying to take a neutral stand, um, especially China. Um, so, uh, and then of course we're seeing how, you know, a lot of the Euro European Union, the countries in the European Union, as well as uh, North America and uh, who are, you know, coming together in a very, very uh, united way uh, to counteract what uh, Russia has, uh, is, has, is doing. So I think all of this is uh, very interesting, especially when you look at what will be played out in Bible times, uh, in the, sorry, in the end times, uh, as um, given to us in in Scripture. Um, uh, when we, especially when we look at the build up towards Armageddon, the final war, uh, we know that um, uh, you know the Scriptures do reveal to us that, uh, um, and this is in Revelation. Uh, uh, 16 uh, that uh, towards uh, you know the the end of the seven year tribulation uh, the nations of the earth will be uh, uh, will move against uh, or towards uh, Israel as a nation uh, uh, and that's the build up of the war towards Armageddon and uh, uh, you know and if you just see how all of that plays out how the Antichrist comes into power and how he actually unfolds that uh, and you look at what Daniel has revealed you know he talks about 10 leaders coming out of the former Roman <coughs> Empire which largely is the area you know with that that covers the European Union as well as uh, other parts uh, 10 leaders coming there and then one leader coming out who will then subdue three others you know and I'm not saying Putin is an antichrist but I'm just saying you can see that kind of dynamic already happening how Putin has in some way subdued the president of Belarus, uh, meaning he's just having him like a puppet. So very much like that, the Antichrist would subdue three of these 10 leaders. They will just fall in place with him. And uh, they will give him, you know, the means to come into power uh, and uh, the Antichrist. And 
then his all-out attack is against Israel. Uh, and now here, you have, today we are seeing Putin just going against Ukraine, the Ukrainians, I mean, for whatever reason. Um, uh, but you know, you see so much of that here, yeah, uh, and the Antichrist going out against Israel. And then we see uh, Ezekiel 38, 39 shows how Russia would move from the north against Israel. It'll have its allies, um, including uh, Persia, which is modern day Iran, Turkey. Uh, today, Turkey is somewhat opposing Russia, but maybe Turkey will come into alignment with Russia, uh, according to Ezekiel 38 later on. We see Turkey, we see parts of Germany. Uh, we see all those nations mentioned there in Ezekiel 38 that fall into alignment with Russia as it moves in towards, um, towards Israel. As Revelation 16, 9 and 10 talks about the armies of the East, which most likely would be, you know, big nations in the East of Israel are, are obviously Russia and China. So they're moving in towards Israel. Uh, so we see all of the, you know, what's playing out today in some ways, like a miniature version of um, the Battle of Armageddon. So, uh, you know, just the dynamics between nations, um, the, the, the alignment of nations, you know, towards uh, foreign against each other. All of that is very interesting to see uh, as, uh, as we see, you know, as we, uh, as we see things given to us in the Bible, in Daniel, Ezekiel, Revelation. So from that perspective, I think um, uh, it's just interesting to observe. Of course, what is happening is not nice, but uh, it is interesting to see these things. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much for um, helping us understand uh, what is going on right now uh, through the eyes of scripture. Uh, we have uh, some questions here on our chat. These questions are from Herbert. Uh, so Herbert asks, um, some people say the first day of the week is Sunday, whereas others say it's Monday. And I think some others say Saturday, uh, who are most correct. So that is Herbert's first question. So maybe we'll take up this question and then uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and read Herbert's next question. So which is, the week's first day. Who is correct? So that is his question. Uh, would uh, one of our faculty uh, like to answer this question? Uh, Pastor Paul, any any insights, thoughts on this question? Uh, hi, uh, Pastor. Uh, okay. I'm not really sure uh, oh, okay. about this, so uh, sorry. All right, all right. Yes, thank you so much. So then I'll just leave it open to any of our faculty to please take this. Uh, Pastor, would you? Mm, yeah, how about, um, so if you want to go biblically, um, biblically, um, Sunday is also referred to as the first day of the week. Um, that's the resurrection day. And uh, uh, so uh, in, New, in the New Testament, Sunday is referred to as the first day of the week. So that's biblically. Also, if you uh, look at it from a calendar standpoint, um, we know our all our calendars start with Sunday, uh, Sunday to Saturday. So from a calendar practical standpoint, Sunday is also the first day of the week. So um, now, of course, Monday is considered the first day of the work week. So it depends if somebody's talking about the work week, then obviously they're referring to Monday in most parts of the world. Uh, in the Middle East, you know, they have Friday as their day off. So their work week may start on a different day, either a Saturday or a Sunday. That just depends on their part of the world. But generally speaking, if you want to look at it biblically, biblically, uh, the first day of the week is Sunday. If you look at it from a calendar perspective, uh, the first day of the week is Sunday, or the first day of the work week is Monday. So that's why. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Herbert. Uh, the next question that Herbert has here for us is, uh, Ash Wednesday, is it when Jesus went in wilderness for 40 days? So uh, Ash Wednesday, like how does that come about? Is it correlated to the, um, you know, the, the fasting that Jesus took? He went into the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, Pastor, would you please like to answer this question as well? Um, um, I don't know too much about Ash Wednesday, but... <laughs> mm, yeah, I think uh, it's, uh, uh, the Ash yeah, yeah. Wednesday is uh, the, actually 46 days before uh, Easter Sunday. So, But when you don't count the Sundays, uh, so it's a 40-day season and it's basically uh, represents Christ's uh, time of temptation in the wilderness. Um, mm. So these 40 days is, uh, you know, uh, people just spend time in repentance, fasting, uh, and uh, just focusing on the Christ finished work, what he's done, uh, you know, just kind of uh, uh, time of personal uh, growth, time of personal reflection, one's own life, uh, taking time out uh, to just, uh, uh, you know, look into their own lives, uh, just uh, spend time with the Lord and uh, and this ash, I think, is basically about, uh, you know, when, the, like the Old Testament, when uh, people used to repent of their uh, sins or when they're mourning or, uh, you know, when they're grieving, they used to uh, shave their head and uh, they used to put on sackcloth and they used to sit in uh, uh, ashes, basically uh, resembling or, uh, you know, symbolizing that uh, they are repenting of their sins. Uh, ash is like, you know, when you burn something that is dead. So, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so you just are in a time of mourning, of a time of repenting of their sins or grieving. Uh, so it just symbolizes that, yeah. Mm. So it's just a time when the church will celebrate uh, or uh, take time off to just uh, focus and, uh, you know, time of repentance, fasting and focusing on the Lord. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Selina, uh, for you know, sharing. Thank you, Pastor. Mm. Yeah, and thank you, Herbert, for also asking these questions. Uh, we'll go further if um, you know any others have uh, things that you would like to ask, then uh, please do. Uh, yes, Divya, I, I see that you've raised your hand. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, my question is from Hebrews chapter 9, um, which uh, I'll just, uh, it's talking about uh, the tabernacle and how the lampstand, uh, the table, showbread, all these are arranged. And in verse 4, it talks about the altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant uh, within the most holy place. Uh, in Hebrews 9 verse 4, I'll just read the verse 4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. Um, yeah, and uh, it just keeps uh, telling about uh, those things in the most, in the tab, in the sanctuary. Right. Uh, so my question is, like, when we read the Old Testament, we get to see that the uh, altar of incense is um, outside the most holy place like it is in front of the veil but here in Hebrews uh, chapter 9 it is mentioned that it is within the most holy place so uh, I had a question why is it is it has the author deliberately mentioned that way uh, is there any importance thank you Yes, thank you, Divya. Thank you so much uh, for that question. So uh, Divya is asking about the position of the altar of incense, whether it is in the um, in the holy place or you know the the most holy place. Um, so why has the writer of the Hebrews included it here in the most holy place? Okay, if uh, any of our faculty would like to answer that. In the golden uh, uh, altar of incense, it stood at the veil before the Holy of Holies. 
So that is where it was placed. It was placed at the, uh, you know, just uh, uh, stood at the veil before the Holy of Holies. I think in the, uh, uh, in the Holy of Holies was just the Ark of the Covenant. So I, if you look at uh, various translations, I don't know which translation uh, uh, she's read. Maybe we can see various translations and see. This is LKJV. Uh, okay. Yeah. But uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the golden altar of incense is just placed at, uh, it stood at the whale before the Holy of Holies. Yeah. And it was used to burn uh, incense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think it's, uh, you know, in the Holy of Holies because their, uh, the high priest would go only just once a year uh, right. to make the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole is the right race. So, and he would make a sacrifice for himself first before he goes in. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's right, uh, Vasilina. In Hebrews 9, 4, uh, it is not very clearly mentioned, at least in my uh, version here in NKJV, it, it seems as though it has been mentioned, it is within the most holy place. Yes, so, you're right, because even in uh, the NIV, it says that uh, behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the altar of incense. Uh, so, but yeah. actually it was placed there. Pastor can add in more. Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm just... Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing, okay, uh, this is not a, um, I, I wouldn't call this a Bible answer. So what, I mean, what Divya uh, pointed out, and this is a very good observation, is that in the tabernacle of Moses, in the inner court, we had the table of the showbread, the altar of incense, and the candlestick. And then in the most holy place, that is behind the second curtain, uh, there was just the Ark of the Covenant that was in the tabernacle of Moses. Whereas in Hebrews 9, uh, as Divya is pointing out, we can see very clearly uh, uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about the altar of incense as being um, behind the second veil, which obviously means the um, uh, the... Uh, the most holy place, right? So, um, so this it seems to be uh, uh, a little contradiction because uh, we know in the Tabernacle of Moses the instructions God gave him uh, the altar of incense was actually not in the most holy place, but it was in the uh, inner inner court. Um, so, whereas here he's positioning the, go, uh, the golden censer as being in the most holy place. Um, so, uh, I don't know, you know, what the writer of Hebrews, uh, why, why he was doing, I mean, why this discrepancy. But what I would like to, um, what to say, I'm just taking a guess here. I'm not uh, saying this is the right answer. But what we, are, what we know is when uh, Moses was instructed to build the sanctuary, he was instructed to build a copy of what was already there in the heavens. So that means the heavenly tabernacle was already in place. That means the way God had set up the, the heavenly, um, his throne room and his place of worship in the heavens was already there. And Moses was supposed to make a copy of that. So, um, and this is my uh, thought, that when God gave the instructions to him, he intentionally positioned the um, altar of incense outside the most holy place in the inner court and say, you, you put it there. Uh, because everything has a meaning. It's, it's, uh, it's telling us that, uh, you know, th 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 this is how you do it, and it has a meaning. So uh, the high priest would come on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, and I think actually multiple times a week, into the inner court where he would 
you know, uh, trim. And then the candle sands, of course, gave light to what he was doing. He would replace the showbread and he would uh, work on the altar of incense, make sure that the fire kept on burning. So uh, it, was some, it was something that he would do on an ongoing basis, telling us that uh, these things, which is eating of the bread and the showbread and the altar of incense is something that's always ongoing. You keep on doing it but the high priest could only go into the most holy place once a year, right? Where the Ark of the Covenant was. He would go there only once a year. Whereas this, the inner court, where he would be doing these things, was happening every every week, not every day, but every week. Now he was engaging and there's something that was an ongoing thing. Whereas things have changed in the New Testament, for the New Testament believer, these three partitions no longer exist in the sense that we know that um, Christ has rent the veil, he's opened the way, and so everything has changed. Um, and the New Testament believer uh, can learn from the Old Testament tabernacle as, uh, 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 as giving some meaning, but the New Testament believer is encouraged to come boldly, you know, uh, we have the you know Hebrews 10 in the next chapter he says we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus meaning is like hey there's no not no more of these uh, partitions and divisions and um, unlike the Old Testament you know where they had only certain times where they can go into the most holy place the New Testament believer just walks right in so this no longer uh, is of any uh, uh, importance and yet to the New Testament believer in Hebrews 10, he's saying, he's, he's kind of drawing similarities. He says, wash your conscience, sprinkle your conscience from dead works, which is, you know, uh, what, what they would do in the outer court when they would use the, the wash basin to wash themselves. So everything has changed. There are, these partitions do no longer exist, which means that in heaven, those Partitions are not of any importance. Uh, Hebrews 5 says our hope goes right into the veil. So it means, you know, it's it's no longer there. Hebrews 10 is saying we come right into the holiest, most holy place. And yet he is drawing some comparison, like he's saying, you know, you sprinkle your heart uh, from an evil conscience. Uh, you enter in with a pure heart. So he's drawing some similarities. So I think, and, I, and this is only my guess, that... Uh, the reason Hebrews nine is is not really very special is not really paying attention to where the altar of uh, the golden censer, which is the altar of incense, which represents the prayer of the saints, which we you know we see in Revelation five. Um, it's not so important anymore, is because these partitions no longer exist. Although we engage in the spiritual type of uh, spiritual ministry that these things represent, so. It, uh, the believer is always involved in what the altar of incense symbolizes, which is the prayer of the saints. The believer is always involved in in what the the uh, uh, the uh, wash basin uh, represents, which is cleansing his heart of dead works. The believer is always involved in the uh, brazen altar, which is a sacrifice. He offers his body as a living sacrifice. Uh, he and he also offers up spiritual sacrifices. The believer is always involved in the table, the showbread, which represents the word of God. He partakes of the word of God. And the believer is always in the most holy place, which is you know, the very presence of God, the very throne room of God, where the ark, which is the ark of the covenant. So for a believer, he's, al he's always engaging in all of these. So where these things are located really doesn't matter. And so uh, the reason Hebrews 9 is positioning the golden censer in the most holy places because the believer is always involved in it uh, and it no longer matters to us. So that's why, and, th and this is my guess. I'm not saying we can prove it from scripture, uh, but um, uh, uh, you know, when we look at Hebrews 5, 9, 10, where they talk about how the believer engages with the heavenly sanctuary, there is no longer these clear, demar clear set demarcations of outer court, inner court, most holy place. So that's why I think um, the altar of incense or the golden censer is placed uh, in the, behind the veil because we enter there behind the veil. 
this is my guess. Um, you can take it or leave it. It's free. Sure, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. I was all, also thinking, is it also because um, the veil has been torn now? Yeah. Yes. So for the believer, yeah, there's no more demarcation. There's The mm -hmm. veil has been torn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10 tells us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Vivia, for the question. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, explaining it uh, so well to us. Uh, John Paul has a question. Uh, he says, uh, can a believer invest in cryptocurrency? Okay, so anyone who is uh, familiar with cryptocurrency, one of our faculty, if you could uh, kindly answer John's question here. Yeah, John, this is just my personal opinion. Again, this is not chapter and verse. This is not Bible. Um, so basically, you know, if you just go back to the very basic ideas, uh, why do we invest? Uh, we invest to make our money grow, right? That means uh, you're letting money do its work. You know, you make that money multiply money, and that's what it does. So but whatever investment, you keep your money in the bank, yeah, they may give you one, one or two percent interest in a regular account, but you know the the, the reason they give interest is they're saying uh, your money can grow if you keep it here. If you move to a fixed deposit, uh, they say, okay, yeah, your money can make five to six percent interest now, if you keep it for a certain period of time. So again, they're encouraging money to grow. Money is doing its own work without you doing any work, and that's another form of investment. Uh, if you put it into the stock market, the mutual funds, um, there uh, they promise you know anywhere between nine to twelve percent, fifteen percent, seventeen percent. Sometimes they make crazy people may say thirty percent, <laughs> which usually never happens. But um, so again, there's an incentive there that is your money can grow uh, uh, by multiplying itself if you invest. But of course, there's all risk. There are different kinds of funds, and there are risk involved in different things so uh, they're just saying you know if you if you if you are willing to take risk well you you may get a higher return uh, it may multiply at a higher rate but it's a higher risk right so similarly uh, why do you buy property why do you buy land it's again an investment that uh, you put money in to buy uh, a property and then the, the value of the property increases and so the value of your money increases and then maybe you know five years 10 years 20 years whatever you want to do you could sell the property whatever so your your money basically you're making money grow uh, by letting money do its work so every form of investment whether you know these things so and then nowadays there are so many other kinds of investments that are available for instance you can invest in um commercial properties and so so many so many so many kinds you can invest in uh in uh, gold or you know uh, precious metals or you can whatever there's so many different kinds of investments that are available today so the uh, and so cryptocurrency the name sounds bad crypto but it simply is a, another form of investment that uh, another place where you could put money and expect money to grow and uh, uh, because of you know the, the maybe the last five maybe or oh, ten maybe more recently five years uh, because uh, it seems to be uh, uh, you know, you could get high returns, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, it's it's become a place of interest. So the, to answer your question is, it's entirely up to the believer where he or she wants to invest money. Basically, where do you want to put your money so that you can make your money grow? You can keep it in a regular bank account for one or two percent. You can move it in a fixed deposit for five or six percent. You could move it into the uh, into mutual funds for eleven or twelve percent or fifteen percent. Uh, you could move it into bonds, uh, you know, again at a different rate. All of these options are there. It's entirely up to up to you where you want to invest your money, um, depending on the risk and so on. Uh, the only, I mean, the only thing we can see from the Bible is that Jesus encouraged us, you know, in Luke chapter nineteen when he gave money to those, uh, to each one of the, um, uh, the the three people. He said, "To one he gave." Uh, 10, 5, and 1, he told them to go and invest. I mean, he didn't use the word invest, but he told them to go and engage, you know, occupy till I come, multiply this, 
engage in the financial system and multiply what I've given you. So, you know, we could see that, that, that the Lord is interested in us. And for the one person who came back and said, Lord, I didn't do anything. He said, at least you should put my money in the bank. So you'd have got it back with interest. You know, that's how we rebuke that person. So uh, from the Lord's side, uh, from God's side, yeah, he wants us to be good stewards with the finances. But where you invest, it's entirely up to, uh, you know, the individual. And uh, the only thing we should avoid is doing something that's wrong, unethical, illegal. Uh, but there's nothing, you know, necessarily wrong, unethical uh, with uh, cryptocurrency, except that it is deregulated. It's not regulated by governments uh, uh, as opposed to the other forms of investment. So there's a higher risk, right? It's like a free market. There's nothing wrong with free market. People are just trying to create something that's open and accessible for everybody. Uh, so that's a huge difference. It's unregulated, whereas other forms of investment are regulated by governments. So there's a higher risk here, but they talk about higher returns. So the answer to your question is, uh, you know, you're free to do you know, what, whatever you feel. Okay. Sorry for that long lecture, but... <laughs> Thank you, Pastor, and uh, thank you, John. I think your question is answered. I can see your comment here on uh, the chat. So uh, uh, we'll continue. We have, we still have some time. So if there are more questions, then please do uh, ask them, and our faculty is here to answer them for us. Pastor Nancy, uh, Divya yes. had raised her hand up. Uh, yes, I. Uh, okay, Divya, is that a new question that you have? Thank you, Pastor Lina. Or uh, uh, no, uh, sorry, I think uh, it's my hand raised up. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is raised. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Anything that's, uh, uh, you know, any anything about you know uh, our personal lives our walk with the lord uh, or you know, anything that's going on around us yes yes uh, avni has a question for us uh, avni okay she's posted on the chat she says pastor can you explain colossians 2 17 through 23 focusing on verse 18 and then verse 23 does it have anything to do with the Lent season. Okay, I'll uh, quickly get this passage for us. Please give me a moment, I'm just looking it up. Okay, for some reason, uh, I'm uh, stuck with uh, the amplified version, it doesn't seem to change. So I'll just uh, post it in the same version here. So that's uh, verses 17 through 19. And twenty through 23 from Colossians chapter 2. So uh, this passage says, such things are only a shadow of what is to come and they have only symbolic value but the substance the reality of what is foreshadowed belongs to christ let no one defraud you of your prize 
um, your freedom in Christ and your salvation by insisting on mock humility and the worship of angels, going into de detail about visions, the claims he's, he has seen to justify his authority, puffed up in conceit by his unspiritual mind and not holding fast to the head of the body, Jesus Christ, from whom the entire body supplied and knit together by its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that can come only from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were still living in the world, do you submit to rules and regulations such as do not handle this, do not taste that, do not even touch. These things all perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These practices indeed have the appearance that popularly passes as that of wisdom in self-made religion and mock humility and severe treatment of the body, but um, uh, ascetism, but uh, are of no value against sinful indulgence because they do not honor God. So, uh, Avni, your question with regard to, you said more specifically, verse 18 and 23. Okay, so um, basically what Avni is trying to say is that uh, um, Mama, I just wanted to yeah. know okay. Yes, um, this is what uh, we see in the Lent season. They abstain from eating yeah. certain foods. They they go into repentance for a season mm. and uh, all this. So is it uh, is it commanded in the Bible? Or because this passage, if you see, it says that uh, we. If, I forgot to mention sixteenth verse. It says, "Do not let, uh, so let no one judge you in food and or in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths." It starts mm. with there, and then it goes on to say that they are shadow of things to come. So I just wanted to know if there is any connection of Lent season with this passage uh, or uh, if this is separate and Lent is a separate uh, thing. So just wanted to know that. Okay. Yes, thank you, Avni. So uh, basically what Avni is asking is now that we have freedom in Christ Jesus, uh, Paul is, you know, uh, Paul is um, letting the Colossian believers know that they must not get you know, and they must not lose that freedom by entangling themselves in certain uh, practices which are not really, uh, you know, necessary for salvation. And also he goes on to explain, you know, the way he uh, talks about certain practices that people held, but they, again, uh, in no way really, uh, you know, are required uh, in our worship to God. So that is Avni's question. And she asks whether Lent, Lent, the practice of Lent, um is uh you know uh, something that is that this passage is talking about so if uh, one of our faculty would like to answer pastor selena would you have any thoughts on this actually in verse uh, 16 uh you know uh paul is uh, saying here that uh, you know much of the ceremonies of the law of moses uh, you know, consisted in distinction of meat and days. And, uh, uh, you know, it appears that the, that those who keep those distinctions, uh, you know, uh, it's not necessary now because uh, Christ has come, he has canceled all the uh, ceremonial law and uh, we don't have to keep it. Uh, so Paul is writing and saying that let man uh, not impose these things upon you uh, because God has not imposed them. Um, and that the life that is centered, centered on Jesus uh, and what he did on uh, on the cross has no uh, place for legalism, uh, you know, whether it's food, drink, or special days or uh, festivals. So that is what he's uh, basically trying to tell them here and about the angels. Uh, it, there was this false teaching uh, that was uh, it was happening in at the church at Colossae when they they felt that you know being humble was uh, a way of humility was actually uh, you know worshiping of angels. Uh, but Paul is saying that it's not the worship of angels, but uh, worshiping uh, Jesus and uh, and uh, what he has completed on the cross. When it comes to uh, thinking about, uh, I, I mean, 
looking at this context and uh, uh, you know what it has to do with Lent. Uh, uh, yes, we don't have to uh, celebrate uh, this Lenten season, um, um, but actually, it uh, the church does. I think because it is a time when uh, you know we can. Uh, get people's uh, attention to focus on the cross and uh, uh, what Jesus has basically done on the cross. So uh, when uh, Paul is writing uh, in uh, to the church at Colossae, he's saying don't have celebrate these special days and, you know, uh, uh, and uh, about uh, how to fast and, uh, you know, observance of food and other rituals. Uh, and the kind of meat that you have to eat, which is accordance to the law of Moses. Uh, but, you know, focus on what Christ has done in the finished work of the cross. Uh, so I think what the church is really doing during this Lenten season is, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are focusing on uh, the cross on what Jesus has done. So uh, on various topics around the cross and uh, drawing people's attention. Uh, so it's a good time of uh, a learning for people, especially the traditional church where uh, topics like sanctification, redemption, justification are, is not uh, taught or people don't know. It's a much detailed study that they do during these uh, the Ash Wednesdays uh, and during the season of Lent. Uh, and also for people uh, to give up certain things um, and, you know, just focus uh, uh, on on the cross and what Jesus has done is also uh, in, in a way a good thing because some of us also go into you know some people take a 20 day fast 30 day fast a 40 day fast for themselves uh, you know, just to seek the Lord just to wait upon the Lord and uh, so uh, in one way yes it's it's a good thing but if you look at it in this context of what Paul is saying in, uh, to the church at Colossae is don't you know uh, uh, hold on to uh, the mosaic uh, uh, rituals like uh, even Paul writes to the church at uh, Ephesus you know because uh, the the Judaizers uh, uh, those who are Jews who were becoming Christians were bringing in this whole rituals uh, Old Testament rituals Jewish fables myths that they were teaching that were becoming uh, you know uh, uh, like a false Teach, uh, teaching that was happening also about uh, you know circumcision they were saying that those who believe in Jesus uh, all of the Gentile believers have to be circumcised and it was uh, and Paul was saying it was not necessary uh, so in in that way yes there are certain rituals which we don't have to follow uh, of the Old Testament law uh, but in in if you look at it even what God had given them regarding food and all it it is basically for our own health for our uh, uh, for our well-being for our wholeness the kind of meat we need to eat the kind of food we need to eat so we focus on those uh, you know nutritional kind of aspects and we can still follow those mosaic laws but uh, you know observing uh, days just like ritual becoming a ritual is not something that is uh, is going to help but something that is going to really bring about uh, repentance uh, focusing on the cross what Jesus has done for us and uh, can also you know uh, 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 get back people to uh, their walk with their Lord with their time with their Lord and also uh, you know their uh, if they've gone back on their old ways uh, to come back to the Lord so it's a good time that uh, we could see that in a positive way, uh, what Lent can do in, in the life of the church and in the life of believers. Yes, yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Pastor I hope Sophie. I answered, uh, sorry, Pastor Nancy, I hope I answered Avani's question. If anyone else wants to add in, uh, they can add. Yeah, uh, Avani, uh, is, is that all right? I hope you got your answer. Yes, uh, I I think I, I, I got it. <laughs> thank you. All right. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Selena, and uh, thank you, Avni. We have another question here, but uh, because we don't have time, uh, I think we would need to take this up in the uh, next mentoring hour, which is next uh, Thursday. So, Paul, if you don't mind, um, you know, we will take up this question in the next mentoring hour. Uh, is it right for married couples to have their conjugal rights when they are fasting. Okay, so we will begin with this question um, uh, next week. Uh, let's pray and close right now. I would like to request someone to please uh, go ahead and pray, please. Pastor Selena, would you? Yeah. 
Father, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you, God, that uh, we can learn so much from your word. Thank you for your word that is truth, that the truth sets us free. Thank you for the revelations that we receive from your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us, for guiding us. Uh, we just commit the rest of this day into your hands. We pray and thank you for each of our students. We bless them in your name, Father. We pray for your uh, grace and your wisdom to be imparted even as they learn and uh, even as they study. We pray for all of us as faculties, God, that you would uh, uh, enable us, strengthen us, give us your wisdom so that we can teach and uh, uh, use your word effectively, God, to minister to uh, the lives of people that we are ministering to. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Selena. Thank you, all faculty and students for joining in this morning's mentoring hour. Uh, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And we will meet again tomorrow for the Supernatural Hour at 8 a.m. So please do join in. Thank you and bye for now.